Hello and welcome, welcome. Uh, today we're going to animate something and we're going to start from scratch using this default uh, file that I created as a startup file. Because as you know, when it comes to animation and getting it into Planet Coaster, your orientation is very crucial. If you don't have your orientation set up in this way, when you go to export, your animations will come out looking funky and weird. And I will show you uh, things that you have to do before you export when you're doing animation for it to work inside of Planet Coaster. Because uh, if you don't do these specific steps when you do export it into Planet Coaster, uh, it will do what we call a uh, a weird deform transformation where the armature is has been placed in a different place during the compile in TMTK, and then it causes your model mesh to animate weird. Alright, so <clears throat> to get us started here, we're going to go with a cylinder. And we're going to change the default 32 to something more reasonable, like 8 or 12. Okay, so 12 gives us a fairly good starting point at 2 meters each. And we're going to push 3 and 5, so your you should look it should look like this, right? Orthographic view. And we're going to bring this up to about here for now. <coughs> then we're going to go into edit mode, face, select this. And I'm going to show you a tactic for UV mapping which can actually benefit you and save you a lot of time. So at this point we're going to use our smoothing groups to make this object look smooth. So edge mode, select this edge, shift alt to select all of the edges and make them dedicated sharp and then do the same down here and dedicate sharp now we're going to turn this on so we can see through the model and we're going to double A push A to make sure everything is unselected and then push B which is box mode and grab all of those edges and then we're going to call those smooth. And then, while it's still selected, push the face. And then B, and all these little boxes here are the faces, so we want to make sure that they're all within the box. So now all those faces are selected. And for faces, we're going to click smooth. And go back into object mode. And over here in VIS groups, auto smooth, turn that on. And we can kind of see the edges there. So let's play with this number until we get something that we're happy with. So 45 looks good. 
didn't matter if we went 45 or 90, it still looks the same. So that's good. And we'll switch this back to edit mode. And go up here. And go to UV editing. And we don't need that. And we don't need this. But we do want this one. And we want to change this to 20 meters. So we can see the object. And then we want to move this over. Grab this one. Go to shading and UVs. Your line tool. Pick this edge right here. We can turn this off to make it easier. Pick this edge right here. And go down here to your UV mapping options and mark seam. And then do the same thing on the reverse side. Mark seam. And then shift alt to grab these edges and mark seam. And then do the same thing for the top. Now that we did that, if we push A to select all, and then U and unwrap, it unwrapped it for us. <coughs> then when you're down here, you see how it kind of like overlaps here, and you think you have to move this out of the way to find your options? Well, the other way you could do it is if you have your mouse scroll over here like this, push the middle mouse button, and you'll see these two little arrows. And with that, you can move the whole thing over. So if you need to get to your other options, that's how you get to them, is middle mouse click and pull it either direction. So we'll select our island tool. And we want this one. And then we're going to push G and bring it up. And select these two, or select this one, push G and move it up. And then we don't want the edges to touch, so we're going to bring it in some. And if you're using flexi colors, when you're UV mapping, you need to have the edges of your UV coordinates at least 6 pixels away from the outer edges. And that information is in the guide. <coughs> Middle mouse click, drag this over, UVs, export UV layout. Now, when <coughs> right here in size, you can change this to the standard for Planko, which is 256. If you do that, then your starting point for making your texture is at um, the Planet Coaster frontier recommendation size because if you leave it at default to 1024 that's two times larger than the recommended size for planet coaster and our object is not going to be bigger than one meter it I mean it's it's two meters yeah but the amount of detail that we're going to be putting on it doesn't really call for a texture size bigger than 256 so 256 is a good starting point for this object so then from here we're gonna call this bucket underscore UV export layout okay so now that I have co coordinates in there I'm gonna go back over the default here to get back into modeling mode I'm gonna go materials new we're gonna call this wood because we know this is going to be a bucket so this particular bucket is gonna be a wooden bucket so we're gonna call it wood and right here in cycles render materials we added one and called it wood 
Now over here where it says diffuse BDS, that's what you want in this one for surface. And for color, you want to change this using the dot image texture. And then from here, this is where you would open your UV. And there's our bucket UV. And then select this and go to material and now we can see it applied. Push A to get rid of the orange and turn that off. And we can see our UV attached to our object. Now I've already gone and uh, made a texture for this particular object. So I'll just go back over here and open that. And as you can see I have everything properly named. And the one that I want to use for when I take my screenshot of the object is this one right here. Which is the wood diffuse skin. So it looks like that. Mm. Okay, so now a bucket has an inside, so we're going to create the inside. So we're going to select this face and push the E key for extrude and then S to scale it down. And see, since this object was already originally UV mapped, it's automatically applying the texture that we created to these um, vertices and faces. So now when we extrude again and go down, these faces already have the texture applied to them. Now currently it's stretched because it doesn't really know what to do with the information, but it's already pre-textured for us. And at that point, we have our lines, our, our, our lines seams here, so we'll just, with our edges selected, we'll select this one, and then we'll select this one, and we'll mark seam. And then we'll grab these faces here, here, go to UV editing, now see it made them into lines, so all we have to do is push U and unwrap and it'll straighten them out. Now we just take this one and we push R and Y and 90 and that'll rotate it and then push G and pull it over, Grab, push shift to grab both of them and G to move it. And that's all we need to do. Then we go back to default. And say now it's not stretched anymore. Now we want to see through this object. So we're going to select that bottom piece. And now that we can see through it, we can pull this down some more. Go back into object mode. And material. And you see they're not stretched, because we properly UV'd them. <clears throat> and now, going back into edit mode, verti vertical selection, and turn this on so we can see through the model. And we're going to push A to unselect all that stuff. And then we're going to push B and grab all of these verticals up here. And then we're going to push S and pull this out. And push A to deselect and go into object mode so we don't have any lines. And you can see now that we have a bucket, it's UV mapped. None of our textures are stretching even though and everything lines up fine. It's not going like sideways. If you were to UV map this uh, after with everything angled like this, you would be creating seams and the textures would go diagonal on this side and on the opposite side of the seam they would go this direction. 
and you would have to manually rotate every single one of those to get everything to align up perfectly. So the great thing about Blender and experience is when you first start with your primi primitives, that's the best time to start UV mapping because after you've UV mapped it, gave it coordinates, and you start manipulating the mesh, it will automatically keep your textures aligned and straight no matter how many times you shift or move things. <coughs> so uh, UV mapping early on will save you tons of time when you're modeling. And then now that the bucket is shaped like this, it's kind of short because usually one of these are a little bit longer. So we're going to push S and Z to scale this way until we're happy with the scale. And think about there's good. So yes, they're stretching up top, but um, if you wanted to create like, oh, your wooden bucket has m individual planks. I mean, I'm not going to do that for this tutorial, but if you wanted to do individual planks, the way that you could do that is when you're in edit mode, you select every other one of these on the top, and then you just extrude it up. And then you can go back and change the heights of each individual one of those. And you'd want to pull it in slightly if you're going to have another board next to it. Which, you know, then you'll grab the opposites of the other ones. So, just to show you, because it's easier to show you than explain it. I'm going to go ahead and in object mode, our cylinder here. I'm going to go Tools and Duplicate and bring this over. Uh, use this as an example. And turn that one off for now. So if you wanted to make individual planks with, the, with this bucket, more like one of those older buckets, then just grab each one of these. Push E and then pull it up. So it kind of looks like one of those castle tops. And then you would just go back and say, bring this one down a little bit, and then S and bring it in a bit. And then grab, say, this one, pull it up a bit, maybe grab the verticals and pull it down. And grab the face and scale it in a little bit. For each one of these tops, you want to scale in a little bit. And I'll show you why in a second why we do that. And maybe make this one. Have the verticals go this way. And this one. Have the verticals go up a bit. And maybe face and pull it down some. Then you would take this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and that one. Extrude and pull it up. And then scale it in. Scale it in. Scale it in. Scale it in. Same. And same. So, the reason why you're scaling it in is because if you didn't, then these would be, these two faces would be butted up against each other and nobody would see them. So if you want it to look like the boards are individual planks, then you'll want to scale them inward. <coughs> and then if you wanted to add, say, more roughness to these, then you would go over here to your, um, Add selection. And you would just add loop cuts. You could do it that way. Add loop cuts <laughs> to each plank. <clears throat> or you could subdivide. 
which is go grab this line, grab that line, grab this one, that one, that one, Ooh, not that one, that one, and this edge, and subdivide, and then pick how many segments you want to do that in. vertices you can see all the subdivisions there and you just grab your knife tool like this and connect the dots and then push spacebar to complete that loop So we got that. Now say we got these extra subdivisions in here and we don't want them. Then you would simply just grab that one, shift and grab that one, and then go merge at last because we want the first one that we selected to merge with the last one we selected. And then do the same, merge at last. Merge at last. Merge at last. I don't have any other dots in there that we don't want. Any down there? Nope. There's that one though. If you didn't want these ones in the middle, you do the same thing. Just merge at last. <coughs> with your, you can only do that with verticals. You can't do that with faces or edges. But so now we're gonna make this more rough. So we'll just grab that one and pull it up. Grab that one, that one, that one, that one, that one, that one. Bring it up. Maybe grab this one and this one and pull it up some. Like a zoo. Grab this edge, this edge. Pull it down. Shape that some more. And then you have a, a rougher looking wood going on here. So that's if you wanted to add details to your planks. So that's how you would do it if you wanted to do individual planks for your bucket. <laughs> Alright, so here's our generic bucket. Um, if you want to uh, re, re UV map the top piece, then you'll just take your face tool, select one of the faces, push Shift Alt, and select. <laughs> grab the top, shift, alt, and that usually selects the loop, but this time it wants to be a pain, so we'll just do on the edge, and on the edge, fine, <laughs> and we're just going to individually grab them then, And then push U and unwrap it and let it do its thing. Go back in the UV editing and see what it did. Change this to material so we can see what's going on. And then we know our, in this particular um, texture, the grain goes this direction, top to bottom. 
So what we're going to want to do to make all of our grains, say, go this direction, we're going to take each one, middle mouse button, grab, and pull this over. This is the island selection tool. And we're just going to grab that and push R to rotate. We're not doing anything fancy with the UV map, so it doesn't really matter how they fit on here or if they're overlapping, because we're not going to do anything fancy with it. In a later tutorial, I'll go over other UV mapping techniques that you can do, and how to properly set this up, and different methods and whatnot. But for this tutorial's sake, we're just showing you some quick quick tips on UV mapping and modeling and getting you ready for uh, animation. If you wanted this to be exactly rotated, because this one was already straight, then you would push R and 90. Alternatively, you could also push minus 90 if you wanted it to rotate the other way. And then G to move it. Now another thing, you know, you could do is if, you know, this this selection thing can be in the way when you're UV mapping. Sometimes it's hard to tell what's, what's going on because that's in the way. You go down here where it says, um, let's see, where is it? Display. Where it says outline selected, you can turn that one off usually, that one. and see how it's looking and move it around until you find a happy medium for you. Okay, so I know there's a knot hole there. Put it there. And I don't want a knot hole there. Alright, so that looks good. Now, if you wanted to see what all the individual UVs were together on your thing, then just over here push A to select everything, and you can see how they're arranged. So as you can see, with this current UV, everything is kind of overlapping and funky. Normally you wouldn't want to do that if you were, say, you wanted that to have its own texture, you wanted to have the outside have its own texture, the bottom be special, the inside, all that, then you would make it separately. But for this one, we're using this, just one general texture for this object, because what we care about in this tutorial is the animation side, and we don't particularly care about the uh, UV and whatnot. <coughs> So, we just need an object to work with at this point. So... I'm gonna delete this one. 
go into this one because this is the only one that matters right now. And we're gonna change this to bucket underscore L zero. Okay, so once you have your object modeled out, it's UV mapped. At this point, you could create multiple um, copies of this, change them, you know, L0 all the way through 5, and make each one less and less vertices, and then export it into the game. But we want to animate this, so from this point, first thing we're going to do is make sure that our 3D cursor is snapped to 0. Second thing we need to do is we need to make sure that it is within reason of T and TK, which this is 2.5 meters, so that's within reason. So this object's going to be fairly big in, in the game, because uh, a regular size bucket would be super small, but this one's going to be big, and I'm going to leave it big so you can see what's going on as we're working with the animation pipeline. Um, so, before you can even get, before you should ever start adding an armature to your scene, you need to make sure that your default mesh is set to zero. That's a very crucial thing, because if you start adding armatures with scale messed up, or rotation messed up, or location messed up, your entire animation, once it goes into game, is going to be messed up. So we need to change all of these to zero. So we're going to do that in object mode, object, and we're going to go transform, and we're going to origin to 3D cursor, because it needs to be down there, because that's where our animation uh, node is going to be. So that origin has to be down there on the ground. And I have... Now, in your guys' case, you'll probably want to put the bucket on the ground, but for sake of tutorial, I have mine raised in the air, so you can see what's going on below the object as well as inside of the object. Okay. Um, so yeah, transform, origin, the 3D cursor. And we want to go apply, rotation and scale, so these go back to zero. And then we also want to make sure that we apply the location. If you ever see in these zeros a minus zero, then that means you didn't apply the transforms. You want to see it zero and not minus zero. It needs to be zero. That minus zero will cause your animation to not work correctly and it can also cause lighting issues with inside of Planet Coaster. So, these must be zero before you start getting into the animation aspect. So, <clears throat> from here, now we're going to add armature. Single bone. And, that, and our 3D cursor is snapped down here to the center. So, when we add one, it will snap a very small bone right down there. So, add armature single bone and you can't see it because it's super small but it's there so push s and pull and it'll get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and see it growing now the TNTK rule is 0 0.001 in one axis and 0 0.05 in another axis. So if your bones are too small, then the compiler will reject your object. So you have to make sure that your bones are also within scale of the TMTK limitation. So you want to be, your bones need to be bigger than uh, 50 centimeters. So we are at 50, almost 51 there. So that is the size that your armature bone should be, no smaller than that. If it's smaller than that, then you're going to have problems with animation. 
So now that that bone is the correct size, we're going to go ahead and apply rotation and scale so it zeroes out. Um, this bone right here is the bone that's going to control our entire animation. So over here in bones, we're going to change its name. to, you can call it node, N-O-D-E, or you could call it base. Um, the maximum amount of bones you can use in TMTK is 18. Um, you don't really need this bone for Planet Coaster, but in other games that use nodes to snap objects to those nodes, need this, uh, need this bone here and then the rest of the rig connects to it. So, um, this bone basically is telling the game engine, any game engine, where the center or origin of the animation starts. So this is a controlling bone. So, out of practice from animating for years with other um, engines, games, and systems, I've always put this base bone here. And if you have an overly complicated animation and you can spare the base bone for Planet Coaster, then I would suggest using the base bone because that will control all of the other complicated bone animations right there. So the game doesn't have to figure out, okay, this bone over here is doing this. Okay, this bone over here is doing this. Okay, this bone is doing this. Okay, this bone is doing this. Instead, the game goes, Okay, this bone over here is doing all these things. So, you have to remember that when things are um, working in the background on the game engine, um, <clears throat> the more complicated you make things for the game to read, the more problems players are going to have with your object. So, if you say, okay, this is my controller bone, and this will tell the engine what my animation is doing, rather than the engine having to go and figure out what these bones are doing individually. So, this is a good idea. <clears throat> um... All of my animal animations use this base bone. And that is the key reason why my animals don't lag when you use them in your game. If I didn't add this base bone here, then players would experience lag in their games because their engine is trying to figure out what each and every single bone is trying to do rather than just directing it to this bone to tell it what to do with the other bones. <clears throat> okay, so now that this is zero, and this is called the base bone, or you could call it node, we want, these settings should be checked. We don't ever want to change that. So now, we're going to go wireframe so we can see what's going on. We want to go into edit mode and make sure this ball is selected and push E to extrude and bring this up. Now, since this is the only other bone that we're going to be using, it doesn't really matter how big you want to make this bone. Uh, so you guys can see what's going to go what's going on here. I'm going to make this bone fairly big. Okay. So now with this bone selected like this, we want to go over here and see it automatically named it base point 001. We want to change this name to body because this is the body of our bucket that's going to be moving. And then we're going to go down here, and it's parented to the base, which is this one. So, 
if we were to move this, then this one will follow because it's parented to that one. Or I should say, this this is the child and this is the parent. Whatever, when you're doing animations uh, in the hierarchy, if you were to move the parent, then the children will follow. If you move the child, the parent will not follow. But this object, this bucket is raised and I don't want my bone to be restricted by the parent. Uh, I just want it to be its own thing. So, but it still needs to give its information to the parent so the engine will know what to do with the child. So right down here and here, we're going to leave parent to base. And where it says connected, we're going to uncheck that. Now with the bone still selected, we're going to move this up. And the bone's pivot point is right here. So if we wanted this bu bucket to dump over, then we have to decide where we want this bucket to pivot at. And that would be our pivot point. So if this was, say, connected, this bucket was connected to a rod right here, and we wanted it to rotate based off of this point right here, then we would want to make sure that this is right there. Or if this is just going to be like a falling over animation, then we want our pivot point down there at the end of the bucket. But for... <clears throat> tutorial sake, we're going to say that right here in the middle of the bucket is going to be the pivot point. So this way the bone can stick out of the top of the model. So this is our pivot point. And whatever this bone does in our animation, it's going to send its information to this parent. And then the game is going to reference this parent bone to figure out what all the children are doing. So it doesn't have to do a whole lot of extra calculations in real time to figure out what the children are doing as far as animation goes and so this object will not lag <coughs> okay so now right now our bucket and our armature are two different objects so we need to be in object mode and we want to parent the mesh to the armature. So we select the mesh first and then the armature. And then object parent with in, with automatic weights. You could also do it with control P. And when you look, your armature should be like this, and your object, your mesh, should be a child of your armature, like this. So now, the next thing you want to do is you want to look at your vis groups here. Because the information down here in vis groups is going to be important for the weighting part. So now we're going to go up here to weight paint. And you can see Blender tried its best to weigh, it, weigh the object, but it didn't do a very good job of it. Because Planet Coaster does not support mixed weights. What that means is, see how this is blue here and this is orange, and inside of here is green, and down there is a turquoise color? Okay, it doesn't support that. Um, so anything that's dark blue means it's not going to move with the bone and anything that's bright red will move with the bone and a lot of times when you're doing automatic weights you'll find a bright pink color especially if when you get down to um, using the decimate modifier because you know you're lazy and you don't want to do it one vertice at a time to reduce your things so you're using the decimate modifier and what Blender does when you use Decimate is, yeah, it's taking away extra vertices and extra edges and faces. But at the same time, it's changing your weights. 
So you have to go back after you've duplicated these and make sure that your weights are correct. Because a lot of times what you'll find is it changed the weights to a bright hot pink color. And that means that it's beyond 1. So 0 is dark dark blue and 1 is red, a bright red color. And hot pink is beyond uh, one or more than one and any color between red and blue is between one and zero so you don't want the hot pinks you don't want to see hot pinks anywhere because if you do then you'll have to modify your mesh a little bit to fix the hot pinks um, the other colors you don't have to do any mesh manipulation to fix those you just have to actually go back and repaint uh, so from this point we want to select our base first and you see uh, it has weights applied to it from the base bone which is that one down there and we don't want any of this mesh to be a part of that bone so very first thing you want to do is you want to go over to limit total and you want to change this 4 down to 1 so what that does is limit total is it says okay with our weights you're allowed to have and by default it was set to four you're allowed to have four different bones information on one vertex well planet coaster only supports one vertex with one bone so we need to change our limit total down to one and as you see, the automatic weights automatically change to mostly red down here and mostly blue down there. And then the second thing you need to do is normalize all. And what that does is that smooths out the red to blue for all of your bones. So you do this one first, and it adds the limit total to both of your bones. And then you do normalize all, and that fixes the weights between the two. Now we want to go up here, and, we'll, and since we are working on the base, again, we don't want any color red or any coloration other than dark blue on our object for the base, because we don't want that parent bone to do anything to the mesh. So we're going to change this down to zero. And then we'll go in here and we'll start painting all of the verticals to be solid dark blue. And there's an inside of this as well, so we want to make sure we paint the inside dark blue as well. And you don't want it to be slightly any other color. You want it to be a solid, dense, dark, zero blue. Sometimes there will be like a very slight hint of the light blue, which you could easily overlook if you have a complicated object, so... Make sure you're going in and zooming in and make sure that everything is completely dark blue. So now that's done. Now we're going to go into body. And we're going to do this again. Because double checking your work is always a plus. And then normalize all. And it automatically fixed the oranges and the greens to being solid red and solid blue. So now we need to go back up to weight paint and we need to change our brush to a solid one. And we're going to paint the inside here and make sure that this is a solid red color. Not orange or nothing like that, just a solid red color. And if we see a hot pink then we have to go back and change our mesh to fix that. Because repainting it won't won't work. What it's what Blender is saying when you have a hot pink color is that the mesh is too complicated for the geometry that is used in animation manipulation. So you have to fix your mesh to fix that issue.
and you will find that problem if you use decimate on an object that is intended for animation. <coughs> Right now I'm doing this in wireframe, but you can also do it in solid. It's just <coughs> Blender, since we're using sp uh, smoothing groups, uh, it's created shading on the object that we're trying to weight here. And that shading can easily confuse you and make you think that um, the object is orange or yellow or any of those other colors because of the shading that's applied to it. So I usually do my weighting in wireframe so I see the true colors and there's no shading. And then we just go back and check and make sure that the base is back to being zero. Always go back and forth to make sure that they're correct and when we manipulated the body it messed with the base so now we have to go back and change this to zero. And make sure that that's zero. So at this point now, <coughs> in object mode, with our material selected, we're going to select our armature, and we'll go into wireframe so we can see what's going on here. And remember our pivot point is right here on this particular object. So you want to go... so. If you are weighing or wanting to change where your bones move or whatnot, then you go into edit mode. When you're animating, you're in pose mode. So anything you do as far as moving things around in pose mode are saved down here in your timeline. But any movement you do prior to animation is done in edit mode. So, <coughs> when you're playing around with it, if you want to move your bones around and whatnot, you do that in edit mode. If you want to do animations and save your animations and manipulate your bones to do things within the timeline, you want to be in pose mode. So make sure you're in the correct mode before you start m messing with your bones. <coughs> so, in pose mode, now you see the bone that's active turned blue. If the parent was active, that would be blue, but we're not going to do anything to the parent. We want to do our stuff to the child. Down here in the timeline, starting at zero, this is frames per second. So 20, for 20 frames per second. The more frames you use, the longer it will take for the object to uh, do its animation. So rule of thumb. Uh, this right here, this quadrilateral rotation, you want to change that to Euler XYZ. Because that's what Planet Coaster understands. It doesn't really understand the quadrilateral rotation, but it does understand Euler. So you'll have to change all of your bones to Euler, even your base bone, XYZ. See, so at the moment, that bone has a rotation of minus zero. We'll go back in object mode and make sure that it's actually zero, which it is. So, we're okay. So, back in the pose mode. You want to grab 
your base bone and give it a rotation and location spot on your animation hierarchy. So push I and it should turn yellow. And push I and it'll turn yellow. So this is the default setting to bring any of these things when we morph them back to zero. And that's really all you need is you need a start and end position of your animation for the base bone to be zero. For the one that we're actually going to animate starting at zero frames this is going to be our starting position of our animation so we're going to go ahead and push I on rotation and location. Now we're going to say in 20 seconds this bone is going to rotate to about here. So with the bone selected push S X and 45 Whoa. oh I forgot we're in scale mode <laughs> okay erase 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 <laughs> so with the bone selected and let's out click that we want to push R <laughs> R for rotation <laughs> X and 45. So now our bucket rotated to there. Right? At the 20 second mark. And then up here we're going to push I and I for both of these. You don't really have to do it for the location because the location is already zero but you do need to do it for the rotation so and then we're going to say in 40 seconds right there that tells you your exact number that you're on in 40 seconds <coughs> it's going to rotate 45 degrees more so we're going to push R and X again and change this to 90 Or, maybe I don't want it to rotate that much. Maybe I want it to rotate 45. So, in rotation, I'm going to push I. And with its, its stopping point here, if I were to shift it in the other direction, I'd want it to start at that position. So I'm going to say location's going to be saved at zero as well. Okay, so now it's it's dumped over. Now, when an object that's made at a that is made at a less dense material, like it's not a solid metal object, it's like wood or plastic or something like that. When it hits the ground, it bounces. So, if we want to animate that bounce, then we're going to say, okay, right about here. It's going to go to there. And then push I right here. And then it's going to come back to where it was. Right there. So, we'll select the 40 marker right here. And we will copy those coordinates and then we're going to move our marker here over to 50 and we're going to paste those coordinates and then we're going to push I to save that and now it's gone back up to its position but it has decided to roll away now we're going to say from here to about 60 frames per second it has decided to go this way
and it has shifted a little bit that way and a little bit this way and we're going to save these location and rotation and we're going to say it took it about 70 for it to rotate more it's traveled over here now we're going to put this in solid mode and skip back to the beginning turn the transform off and then push play. And then we see, oh, okay, well that kind of moved a little too quick there between. It did its little bounce, and then it moved a little too quickly to go from this position over to this position. So we're going to copy this. And we're going to take it over here to about 120 frames and paste that. So, copy, 120, paste. And then up here, push I and I. And then back over here to this, we want to get rid of that. So we're going to go back up here, and you push Alt, I, to switch it back to green. And then we're going to grab this one over here. And we're going to copy it. And we're going to say about 80 seconds. Is where it got to that position. So we're going to paste those chords. And make it a keyframe. And then go back over here. And remove the keyframe frame with Alt-I. And we're going to play it. And now it moves over slowly. Now say this right here is the position that is the end of our animation. So we're going to change this to 120. And when this is done, it will return back to its zero position. To restart the animation. Say this is just a triggered event. Now, this bounce is very rough right in between here. So, this is our focal point. Let's change our graph here. So, we're not looking at a bunch of crap we don't need to see. And we can kind of zoom in on the stuff we want to see. Now we made our timeline all the way across here so we can see individual sections. Alright, so this this bounce is a bit on the rough side. So with our marker over here, we're going to change this one to a graph editor. We're going to bring this over. And at this point we don't need this information, so we're going to close that out, we're going to close this out. move this over. It makes that smaller and we can see our object moving. And following the graph editor we can see the lines and what's going on with our bounce here. So our bounce is between these two. And this is the bounce starting position. So use your middle mouse to scroll out And 
you can hold shift with your middle mouse to move your graph up and down and all around to pan. And moving this. Okay, so right in here is where the bounce is. So, this you can move the point. And these you can manipulate the point. Now we're using an F curve, where you could change it to drivers. But F curve is its own thing. <coughs> So, playing with these F, these F curves, you can get a smoother result. And your bounce. And you just pretty much manipulate these curves until you are happy with your result. And again, you can use your middle mouse button to move your tools over so you can see. Okay. okay so to switch this one back, you just go here and <coughs> change it back to properties. over this one and that one. Okay. Mm. There's a lot more that I would do with this, but for tutorial sake I don't want to bore you with messing with graphs and whatnot. That was just to give you a simple example of how to use the graph editor to manipulate your animations to smooth them out. Make it pretty again. Alright, so from here, we need to take this and make our other. So, be in object mode, select that one. Oops, we're saying that we're happy with the animation. And duplicate, and duplicate, and duplicate, and duplicate, and duplicate. And then change this to one. This two, three, four, and five. Now, because this object is a very simple object, the geometry isn't much. Uh, I'm going to start my decimating process at L two. 
and because this is a simple primitive it's not going to do anything random or sharp as far as the weights go so since you have an animated object here it already has a modifier for animation applied to it so if you were to use decimate on this you need to make sure that decimate is above above the armature modifier decimate has to be up here for it to work properly so let's do that to all of these So for this one, we're going to say it's 0 0.9, and apply, and 0 0.7, and apply, and 0.5, apply, and 0 0.3, apply. So the thing to note is when you are using decimate with animation, if you go any lower than 0 0.3, it will mess with your mesh so badly that it will break your animation. So if you are being lazy and using decimate on your objects, do not go below 0 0.3 because it will break your animation. Okay, so since this one and this one do not have decimate applied to them. They're, they're being turned off for now because we don't need to do anything further with those. But these ones do have decimate applied to them already. So this one is the first one we're going to work on. So we're going to turn off these ones so we don't have to look at them. And we're going to go over into white paint and in vertex mode. We're going to make sure that our weights are zero and our body is set to one so base zero dark blue and body one solid red and for these ones you're going to want to make sure you don't want to push that one for your L LOs for your LODs you don't want to push that one because this has already been made in this one and we duplicated it down but we do want to make sure that the limit total is changed back to one because when you use the decimate modifier it's uh, getting rid of edges lines and verticals and merging them together so now that's adding more information more than one information for each vertical that's left over so we need to make sure that that's limited to one again and then make sure that the weights are correct so that one's done. Now we'll go to this one. Do the same thing. White paint. Check both. Make sure limit total is set to 1. And see how it did 28 vertical weights limited. See, so it assigned weights to vertexes that we didn't want assigned to those vertexes. So that's why we want to limit the totals. And we'll go to the next one. Go into white paint. Make sure both weights are painted correctly. And then limit the totals to one. Let's say it did 14 for that one. Now we're at the crappy, crappy one. Change this to the white paint again. And now this object is really deformed. And body. And that's what I was talking about with decimate, how it creates these sharp edges on your object. If you just uh, took the vertices away on your own, your object wouldn't look like crap when it gets to L5. 
yeah, your user is this far away, but even this far away, I can tell that object looks like crap. <laughs> so, you should be doing that manually and not depending on the software to do it for you. But to each their own. Um, so yeah, that looks good. And then limit total to one, and that time it did eight. Both look the way they're supposed to look. Okay, so now we'll make sure we turn these back on. And make sure that that one is back in object mode. And make sure that every single one of these location, rotation, and scale is set back to defaults. And that it's in object mode. And they are. <coughs> so the next thing you want to do is you want to ha add a hitbox. And <coughs> you can use basic primitives for that. Any one of these things. And you want to make it as cheap as possible. So we could use a box for this. But there will be like parts of it where it wouldn't make sense to attach another object to it. So we'll use a cylinder. And for this cylinder we're going to use 8. And then in edit mode, we're going to push 3. And then we're going to move this here to where we think it's about the middle of the object there. We're going to push scale, S, and Z to pull it up. <coughs> we're going to bring it out to about there. Then we're going to push 1 to look at it from this direction and bring it in this way. Okay, now we're going to use the face selector, grab the top, bring it up, you could be in one, you can push one or you can push three, doesn't matter, and pull it up to where it's just above there, and then push S, and bring it out until it's just overlapping like so. So now it's the actual shape of the bucket. <coughs> And if you want your bucket mesh to sit directly on the ground, then you want this to be just past just that. So go into wireframe so you can see what's going on. Set this to either one or three. Make that box just below that mesh. And go back into object mode. Switch it into either solid or material. And then we're going to name this one hit check underscore one. And your hit check should not be parented to your uh, armature. Set that, set the cursor back to its position with the hit check selected. We want to make sure that its origin is in the center. So now it'll be in the proper place. And now from here you want to select the hit check plus this, plus that, and all of your LOs and your armature. All of that needs to be selected. <coughs> And today I'll be exporting in FBX binary selected objects. Okay, that's fine. We don't want to have that one checked. But you do want to select armature 
Okay, well, pretty much I would have all these selected, that way you don't miss anything. And then, um, right here where it says armature. When you're exporting in binary, where it says armature here. If you have 18 bones, then you want to have this unchecked. Because what this does, where it says add leaf bones. And I'll cancel this export for a second here. Is it adds an extra bone on each one of your individual bones. At the end of the hierarchy, it'll add an extra bone for what it calls extra control. Which is great when you're animating a character. But because TMTK has limitations, you want to make sure that that's unchecked. Because if you're using the 18 bones, and you have that checked, it's going to create extra bones. And then, when you go to load it into the game, it's going to pop back and tell you, you have too many bones. And you're sitting here thinking, okay, well, I have 18, so that should be, it should work. So why is it not working? Well, that's because your export settings were set up to add more bones. So... Uh, if you're creating a small object that's not hitting the limitation of TMTK's 18 bone limit, then you can leave it checked, because that'll add more control over the animation in-game. But if you are using the max 8 bones for your complicated animation, then you want to have that unchecked during export. Okay, so... <clears throat> now... The other thing that we have to worry about is when you're exporting in binary um, and importing it into the TMTK online compiler, when it spits out your UGC model to work with the game, it's going to rotate your armature on the x-axis 90 degrees, but your mesh will stay where it was. Um, so what we have to do is we have to fix our armature before exporting. Otherwise we'll get what is called a morphed animation where it's animating but it's not animating the way we intended it to animate. So to do that with only your armature selected you're going to hit <coughs> R for rotate X and minus 90. Now you see the mesh moved with it. So now we have to go to each one of these meshes. And we have to push R, X, and 90 to bring the mesh back up. And you have to do that for each one of these. Now this is for bin this is specific to binary exporting. This will not work with a C ASC II exportation. This only works for binary. So it should look like that. And then, you're going to have to go back and select every single one of these meshes, including the armature, and go Object, Apply, Rotation and Scale. And if there's a location, then you're also going to want to apply the location. So now what will happen is your FBX, when it's uploaded to the TNTK site, the compiler will leave your mesh the, where it's at. And then it's going to take this armature and rotate it up. So when it spits out the UGC file, it will work correctly in Planet Coaster and animate correctly. So, with everything now selected, armature in all of our LODs. Plus, now we're going to make sure our hit check is selected. We're going to go File, Export, 
FBX. Selected objects, leave these coordinates alone, leave all of that turned on. Do not check that one because this is an animated object. And that will mess with your animations if you have that checked. That is only good for static objects, but that does not apply to animated objects. So at that point, <coughs> once you get your texture maps made <coughs> and upload it to the TNTK compiler, <coughs> your object should work and should animate correctly within the game. Um, so at this point, if you're doing binary exportation, you're done with the video. <coughs> if you are doing ASCII exportation, then there's a different route to take. <coughs> and I will show you that. So, let's bring our armature back to where it was. And our meshes. So, <coughs> Now for exporting in ASCII, what you have to do is you have to grab everything and your hit check and you want to push R X minus 90 and then from here you want to apply the rotations and scales and then file export FBX set this to ASCII selected objects all of this selected Apply modifiers, and all these need to be turned on. And then you're going to change this to Y forward, and Z up, and then export your FBX. And that's how you get animation to work with ASCII. Is the armature and the mesh have to be orientated minus 90 degrees on the x-axis before exporting the animation in ASCII. Alright guys, so have fun with that, getting your object in the game and playing with it. Um, so if you follow this step by step by step, it, follow, it goes through all the things to look out for and all the things that are key to making animation work within Planet Coaster. And if at any point throughout your process of meshing to <coughs> animating to whatnot, you forget to do a s any one of those steps, your animation will not work inside of Planet Coaster. You, all the way up to exporting your object. If your exports, export options are not set up correctly, it will not work. So, uh, when it comes to animation with Planet Coaster in Blender, uh, there's very key things that you need to uh, get yourself into the practice of checking before doing the next step, and then checking again before doing another step, and so on. So get yourselves in the habit of checking all of those things before you move on to the next steps. 
and then at the end make sure that you do these options with the rotation on the x-axis depending on which uh, method being binary or ASCII make sure you're setting up your model rotation and armatures correctly for those individual export options again otherwise if those are not set up correctly during your export to FBX then your model will not work correctly in Planet Coaster <coughs> so that is just a basic to get you guys going and then from there you guys can experiment with more complicated animations but this is just a starting point to give you all and uh, to give you all the things that you need to know to get an object to animate and work inside the planet coaster and it covers all of the questions that everyone has had from watching other people's tutorials and the pipelines for making it easier for you and just some general knowledge really and if you guys have any more questions you can always ask them on PCTM or you can ask them here in the videos or you can pop over to my YouTube channel and do the same mm -hmm. have a great day guys enjoy and I look forward to seeing what you guys animate have a great day bye